Hi everyone, uh, I'm very happy to be here uh, so at home. I work here now for not a long time, so give me one second. So um, I will discuss uh, results that are actually very connected to the previous talk uh, about this all or nothing uh, phase transition that occurs in, uh, I, I focused on a problem that is a sparse principal component analysis that is actually connected to the planted click problem that Scott just discussed. So these are uh, joint results with my uh, friend Nicolas Macri from uh, EPFL. So before entering the problem, let me start by a very biased review of uh, what's going on in high dimensional inference uh, these last 10 years. Uh, again, it's, it's highly biased and it's really my statistical physics perspective. So one class of problems that have attracted a lot of attention these years are the so-called spike matrix or tensor models, which are, if you want, the, the planted version of the so-called P-spin model in physics or the bipartite or tripartite P-spin model. Um, instead, that the, the, the aim here is that you have access to a tensor of data, and you want to, to infer this signal, which is hidden there. Okay? And the equivalent of the, of the interactions are this Z, this noise, which is there. Okay? But you have additional information in this, uh, in the, about the signal. All right. So. In this high dimensional inference problem, we have now quite a few results thanks to the work of uh, many people. And essentially, the, the full package of results now reads like this. You have access to a simple variational formula for the mutual information between the data and the signal, an asymptotic formula, which is uh, just given by optimizing a simple replica symmetric potential. Uh, and you have access also to uh, a formula for the minimum mean square error, which quantifies how close you can, uh, you, uh, how good you can infer uh, the signal X, given that you have access to infinite computational power, that you can compute the optimal estimator, which is the so-called minimum mean square estimator. And the formula is just a simple uh, expression that depends on Q star, which is nothing else than the optimizer of this function, okay? So once you have this kind of formulas, you can draw phase diagrams. So here is the case where uh, the prior, which means the, the, the um, the distribution that generated the IID components of this signal. In the case of P equal 2, so it's a matrix factorization problem. Uh, here you have the lambda, so this is the signal to noise ratio, which controls the strength of the signal with respect to the noise. Here you have P, so the asymmetry between the two possible values that take the, the signal entries. Here the, the entries are just set so that this prior has unit variance, okay? But essentially it's, it's binary spins if you want. So if you start to play with the asymmetry in the, in the prior of this guy, what happens is that you have this phase diagram where you have the so-called easy phase that you've heard about a lot now, where you have efficient algorithms able to reach optimal performance in the inference. Then below this line, you have the impossible phase, which means that whatever you do, uh, you have no way to reconstruct the signal. It is lost due to the noise, independently of any algorithm. And here, uh, you have at this point, you start to have the uh, hard phase, which means that in this region, if you would have access to a large computational power, an exponential time algorithm, you could be able to infer the signal, but we don't know any efficient algorithm able to do so. Okay, so we have clear pictures of what's going on. You can plot the mean square of various algorithms. So the dark line here is the optimal algorithm. The red one is what you get with this approximate message passing. And the blue one is what you get with naive uh, principal component analysis, where you just look at the eigenvector of uh, this matrix. And you see here the presence of this computational to statistical gap, this art phase that also uh, Afonso discussed, that Federico discussed. So this is the, the usual picture. Uh, other type of problems are, for example, random linear estimation. In the case where X is sparse, this is called compressive sensing. You know this matrix phi, which, are, which is called the, the measurement matrix. You know the W, and you want to infer the X, okay? This is a special case of a more generic setting that, uh, that uh, Lenka already discussed, 
which is this generalized linear models, where now the phi matrix here that acts component-wise is essentially whatever you want. Uh, and you want, again, to infer x from this possibly nonlinear or even stochastic measurements. One simple case, which actually uh, has been studied for a long time, is the, the perceptron. Uh, in the teacher-student scenario, what does it mean? Uh, it means that you, have, uh, you feed data into uh, this uh, simple neural network. It outputs labels. And the task is now, I give you this data and the associated output. I hide the weights that are there. And I ask you to recover these weights, OK? So you've already seen this picture. For this problem, thanks to this analysis, so again, we have the, the package of rigorous formula for the mutual information, rigorous formulas for the, uh, for the different type of errors, algorithmic guarantees that tell you that when AMP works, it is optimal. You can plot the generalization error that here uh, is the red line. You see that it drops at some point, but if you try the best algorithm that we know uh, at the moment, this AMP algorithm, you need a bit more of data. Alpha quantifies the size of the training set that you have access to. And you see again the presence of this computational gap here. And you can compare that to simple algorithms. So this is the case of a binary perceptron. In the case of a continuous perceptron, uh, you have no discontinuous phase transition like this, OK? All right, so just to give you an idea of how generic is this model, uh, special cases of this uh, GLM are, again, the compressive sensing problem, which is also related to CDMA, which is an important communication scheme between multi-users. It, it means code division, multiple access. It is related to superposition codes, which, are, uh, which is a particular class of error-correcting correct, error codes for point-to-point -point communications. The phase retrieval problem that you already discussed. Out the boundary between estimation and learning, you have this problem, which we call one-bit compressive sensing in the signal processing community, or the perceptron in machine learning. You have the so-called uh, ReLU uh, nonlinearity, which is fundamental in the sense that it's nowadays probably the most used non-linearity in, in deep neural networks, or uh, the canonical model for binary uh, classification, which is the sigmoid or logistic regression. So you can add, uh, so more recently, there are new layers of complexity that has been added to these models. Uh, so for example, uh, we have been able to study models of shallow networks, which are called committee machines, where now, so it's, it's a generalization of this already generalized linear model where now you have, a, a hidden, uh, you have hidden units here in the middle and you want to, re to infer uh, these, these weights that are there. Uh, another uh, type of model are these uh, deep neural networks but in a pre-trained phase. What does it mean? It means that you have here the weight matrices, this phi 1, phi 2, etc., which represents these weights in this neural network. We can study the mutual information in this in this type of models, which means, for example, the mutual information between the input, so the, 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 the visible units, if you want, and the output, or between any two uh, layers, but in the case where these matrices are random, so okay, you, they are not correlated, you didn't train yet the neural network. Okay? Even more recent results, actually this one is, is, uh, is older, uh, People now still around the group, uh, uh, around Flo and Lenka, in particular uh, uh, Eric, André, uh, Marilou, uh, Benjamin, Bruno, and Antoine, who are in the room, they are looking now at uh, models. They, they try to, to input some structure in the model. Okay? So for example, in this case, they were studying the linear, random linear estimation problem. So again, you have linear projections of some signal corrupted under Gaussian noise. So this is the probability of the, the X you want to reconstruct, given the, the matrix and your data. But you assume that the X is not anymore IID. It is complex object, which has a distribution given by a restricted Boltzmann machine. So it's already solving already this problem is very complex in itself. You can combine them like Legos, and you want to study the physics of this model. You can get a phase diagram, formulas for mutual information, and so on and so forth. Uh, more recently, uh, the people in the room studied this type of models where, for example, uh, you have access to a, a matrix of data which is generated from a low-rank matrix made of the product of two uh, uh, low-rank matrices U and V. 
And uh, let's say that U is simple in the sense that it's IID, but V is a very complicated object itself in the sense that V has been generated from a generalized linear model. Here W is known, and Z is a more primitive signal, if you want, which itself is IID. You need at, at some point some IIDness assumption in order to solve things. But you can combine these two models. You have a complicated graphical model, and all the machinery works, essentially. All right, so this was for the bright side, what we know, but there are many things we don't know, okay? So again, this is a very biased view uh, of what we don't, there are, of course, many, many, many other things we don't know, but this is the kind of things that I'm interested in uh, these days. Uh, so in particular, uh, the non-Bayesian, non-Bayes optimal setting. So what does it mean? These different results that I've told you about, we know everything in the sense that we can compute things rigorously, we have algorithmic guarantees and so on and so forth, in the case where you assume that you know how the data has been generated, okay? You have a perfect matching between the parameters you assume as a statistician and the real parameters that are in the model, okay? So for example, you assume that the signal to noise ratio that you use would be the same, but in the non-Bayesian, in the non-Bayes optimal setting, you have mismatch, the prior could be not the true one that generated the data, the one you assume can be different, and so on and so forth. So then the next uh, bottleneck at the moment is really how to uh, study what happens when you have real structure in the data. So there has been a lot of uh, progress in this direction recently, in particular with the, the work I just shown before uh, by uh, Florian Lenka's group, and also by this great paper that Mark told us about, but still, I think there is much to be done in this direction. Another uh, real bottleneck is uh, what I call new statistical regimes in the sense that at the moment, uh, for example, in the study of these complicated uh, deep neural networks, we need uh, the weights to be fixed. So these are called the, the quenched variables in statistical physics. We cannot allow them to evolve and in, in a sense, we cannot learn them, okay? We, can only study the, the static of these neural networks when things are decorrelated. But of course, in, what you really want to do is to, to, to say something about the learning regime where the parameters here become the dynamical variables that evolve, okay? And this is, at the moment, totally out of reach. We don't know how to do. Uh, there, it really requires new ideas and, okay. Uh, a last point, which is what I will discuss today, is uh, what I call zooming on the corners of phase diagrams. So what do I mean by that? So in statistical physics, so in this kind of approaches, usually uh, the parameters in the problem are fixed. So fixed with respect to what? With respect to the size of the system, n, the number of spins in physics, the number of uh, components in the signal that you want to infer uh, in inference, and so on and so forth. So for example, in physics, the, the external magnetic field is, is something that you fix. It's an order one quantity, the temperature as well, and so on. Here in inference, the noise level is fixed, the sparsity as well. It does not depend on the size of the problem, okay? But there are actually interesting questions that are related to what happens in the corners of the phase diagram. So what happens when these parameters are going to infinity or to zero with n? with the number of variables in the problem. And this is usually difficult to access with the statistical physics method. And this work is related to how to go beyond these techniques and to try to say something about these regimes. So the motivation started with this problem, compressive sensing. Um, so there, there is a paper, a very nice recent paper by Galen Reeves and, and uh, Jaming Zhu and uh, a student of them that uh, studied this compressive sensing problem in the setting uh, where uh, essentially the sparsity will go to zero and the measurement rate, which is the number of measurements divided by the dimensionality of the problem, will also go to zero, okay? So again, you have access to this random linear projections, this W, you know the phase, you want to infer X. In this case, X is a Bernoulli signal, okay? And rho controls the sparsity. So this is the phase diagram of the problem, which is known for a, a long time. Uh, the, the red line is the optimal transition, the information theoretic transition. Below, you have no way to reconstruct the signal independently of any algorithm. Above, you should be able, but the blue line marks the algorithmic transition, 
uh, we have no uh, efficient algorithm able to say anything in this region. And above this line, we are able, thanks to approximate message passing. All right. And in this picture, all these parameters, the sparsity, the measurement rate, the signal to noise ratio, are constants. They, they did not depend on n. They do not depend on n when you do the analysis, OK? After you get formulas, you can play with their values, but they, they're, they're always small with respect to the number of variables. So what did this group is essentially to take this formula, uh, which is the rigorous formula for the, the mutual information and for the minimum mean square error, uh, again in the regimes where all parameters are order one. Uh, just to, to, to clarify things for physicists in the room that, that, that are not familiar with mutual information, this is nothing else than the free energy. So the mutual information between the data and the signal is the Shannon entropy of the data minus the Shannon entropy of the data condition on the signal, which means the entropy of the noise, of the remaining uncertainty. And because we assume in these problems that the noise is always IID, uh, this is a constant. It's very easy to compute. The point is really to compute this object, which is the free energy. So if you're a physicist trying to compute free energies or information theorists computing mutual information, you're doing the same thing. Okay. So what they did is to take this formula and note here the rescaling with rho, the sparsity of the uh, minimum mean square error. Indeed, if you do not rescale by rho, this quantity, when rho will be small, it means that your signal gets sparser and sparser. You have more and more zeros. It will all be, always be close to one because take as an estimator the all zeros vectors it will match most of the components of the signal because it has a lot of zeros. So in order to have a meaningful measure of error, you really need to rescale by, by the sparsity which is there. So they took this formula from the replica method, that is from this theorem, and plot uh, this error letting the sparsity going to zero. And what they observe when they collapse all the curves at the same point, because you have to imagine that this, when a rho goes to zero, these curves they approach a zero, they move. And what happens is that this curve is getting sharper and sharper, okay? And in the limit, uh, the guess is that, uh, of course, it becomes a step function. And this is why the, the, this transition is called all or nothing, because before this, this, in this regime, asymptotically, you cannot say anything, and above, you can perfectly reconstruct the signal, okay? Sorry? x-axis would be uh, the signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, the, sorry, in this case, the measurement rate, the number of data you have access to, rescaled by the uh, phase transition point. So, yeah. At one, it means that you are exactly at the transition. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, it misses. So this is the measurement rate. So what they did um, is essentially to let in their analysis all quantities be sequences of n, okay? Uh, including the sparsity, which is there, the signal to noise ratio, and the measurement rate, which is there. So they zoom really on the corner of this phase diagram. And what they obtain informally is the following. If the sparsity is very small, and very small means lower than 1 over square root of n, and your measurement rate is lower than this quantity, which now is indexed by n, which scales as the sparsity times the log of the sparsity, there, weak recovery is impossible. So weak recovery means uh, that you can do something better than a random guess. You can at least reconstruct a tiny bit the signal. In this case, even that is impossible. So the minimum mean square error will always be one. Okay? You have no way to say anything meaningful. Uh, the converse bound is that when the sparsity now is just small, it scales to zero, but at any rate, and you are above this transition, then strong recovery is possible, which means that you can perfectly reconstruct the signal. So this means that the conjecture that you get from the replica prediction by plotting what happens when rho goes to zero actually agrees with this picture, which is rigorous, uh, at least in the regime uh, where rho is lower than uh, 1 over square root of n. This part is left open, uh, interestingly. Uh, but anyway, so overall this, uh, validates the replica, the replica picture even in this regime where a priori the replica predictions are not correct or are at least are not uh, derived for. 
So what I did is to consider, uh, so I found this, this result very interesting. It was the first type of results like this that I was seeing uh, in a language that I understand at least. And, uh, and also this type of questions I, I wondered about during my PhD, but I, I had at this moment no, no ways to, to try to, to tackle this, this, this type of problems. So now I have tools. Uh, so what I, what, I set, what I did is to consider one of my favorite problems, uh, which is this, uh, this planted uh, P equal to spin model. Uh, so this Wigner spike model, this matrix factorization problem, uh, which is rich enough so that all the phenomenology usually extend to more complicated problems, but at the same time, you, it's easier to define and to analyze. I took uh, Bernoulli uh, IID entries for this XI. And I wanted to zoom, uh, to zoom on this corner when the, the noise level is getting small and the sparsity as well, okay? So this phase diagram, when rho and uh, lambda are fixed, is known from this paper by Thibault, Flor, and Lenka. So essentially below uh, the dashed line, this is the information theoretic transition, you are able a priori to infer, but you are only able to do it at low computational cost uh, below this algorithmic transition, which is uh, the green line. So the picture is, is understood, at least in this regime. Um, so uh, actually, uh, the analysis for low sparsity has been done in the same paper. And what they conjecture is that the information theoretic transition, which is this time in terms of the signal to noise ratio, should scale as log rho over rho. Okay, so this is what you extract from analyzing the replica prediction, okay? So what I did is the same experiment as uh, Reeves and colleagues in the case of compressive sensing. I took uh, the replica prediction, which is a theorem, and uh, I plotted it. So now the mean square error is not over X, but it's over the, the rank one matrix X times X because you, you can never really reconstruct X, okay? Your measurements, they lose the information about the sign of X. You have this invariance that prevents to really reconstruct X. So what you are actually interested in reconstructing is the rank one matrix, which is called the spike, okay? So this is the best estimator of the spike, the minimum mean square error estimator, given the data. So this is the best error you can aim for. Again, you have a rescaling with a row, okay? And I plot this quantity letting rho going to zero. And you see again, when I collapse all the curves uh, as a function of the signal to ratio divided by the predicted information theoretic transition, what happens is that you see that these curves collapse and get super, char super sharp. And in the limit of very small rho, you see a step function, okay? And here, this is the mutual information that is essentially as a slope one, and then it saturates to its maximum value, okay? So how to zoom on this corner? You do the analysis, again, letting all quantities uh, depend on n, okay? So now there are sequences where the sparsity will go to zero. And in order for things to be well-defined, the, the, the signal to noise ratio will have to go to infinity, okay? So you are zooming here. Um, so let me mention uh, that this very high sparsity regime is actually linked uh, to the problem that Scott discussed before, this planted click problem. Uh, and in these papers, actually, they relate uh, the, this inference problem to the planted click problem. And you actually need to be able to say things in this type of regimes to really access what you are, the type of regimes you are interested in the, in the planted click problems, where you have square root of n's that appears and things like this, where things do not scale linearly with n. So you can have a look at these papers. All right, so this is uh, the main result of this study. That, uh, so let me parse it for you. So I now allow the prior which is the distribution from which I generate the IID components of this spike, of this signal that I want to infer, to be a sequence of n. The sparsity depends on n here. This is the continuous non-zero part, if you want, uh, of the prior. This is a Dirac in zero. Uh, and uh, so this lambda also depends on n, and I ask this scaling to verify, to be verified, and this is not 
uh, restriction of the, the method is just that this bound is ugly enough, and if I don't ask this, the bound is, would stop there. And uh, so I have a tr there is a trade-off between the readability of the result and the, the hypothesis, so okay, I prefer this version, but this is not really useful. And this result tells you that the mutual information rescaled by n and as well rescaled by this coefficient here, which is very important, minus a replica symmetric formula, a simple variational formula uh, that depends on a simple scalar parameter here, where this function reads like this, is small. And this is what I mean by going beyond uh, the, the thermodynamic limit. Because in physics, usually the thermodynamic limit is you let the number of spins go to infinity, and intensive quantities, free energies, internal energy, and so on, you need to rescale them by 1 over n in order for these quantities to have limits. Okay? In this setting, you do not need to rescale by 1 over n, but by 1 over n times these things. And this is how this object will have a limit. Okay? So this goes to zero much slower. Okay? So uh, essentially, so this, this difference is small, okay? So trust me on that, this is going to zero. And in particular, if you choose, if you, if you place yourself at the scaling where you should observe a phase transition if the replica prediction was correct, which is this scaling, the SNR scales as log rho over rho, and you let the sparsity go to zero at a certain rate, like this, then the bound becomes clean, which is nice. And uh, let me also mention that you could wonder, can you really estimate this thing? Because we have things that go to infinity, things that go to zero, like this. But actually, when you rescale with this quantity here, this object here is well-defined, and all quantities go to, tend to finite numbers. Okay? So you can plug that in a computer and estimate it easily. Okay? So you see, it's a kind of asymptotic formula evaluated for finite size values of the parameters that can depend on n. So it gives more information and you get a precise evaluation of the finite size effects. Okay? So I'm not claiming that this bound is optimal, but I think it's not far from being optimal. Yes. It's linked to that, yes. Otherwise, th this, would, this would go to zero, essentially, because uh, the, the, the all zero vector would dominate. All the, so, you, yes. So, um, just to mention that this result is kind of complementary, even if these people looked at a different problem, which is compressive sensing, I'm looking at this sparse PCA problem, the results are complementary in the sense that what they manage to, to, to assess are results when the sparsity is going to zero very fast, while my result, our results, is when the sparsity goes to zero but not too fast. So maybe by combining the two methods in different problems, you, you can really get the predictions for the full range of, of, of parameters, of scalings. All right, so um, this all or nothing. So now, I again place myself around the phase transition. I set the signal to noise ratio to scale with the predicted information theoretic transition, which is a sequence of n. Uh, and the, the ratio is this gamma. Okay? And what we can show is that this formula, thanks to this rescaling, is tending to a simple function. It has a limit, and this function is just this object. And the minimum mean square error is indeed tending to what is predicted by the replica symmetric formula, which is this step function. So this, this picture, which is only valid again a priori when rho is always infinitely small with respect to the size of the system, or it cannot depend on the, on the size of the system, is actually valid when this parameter evolves with n. Okay? Uh, let me mention that these results are uh, in agreement with uh, other recent results uh, by uh, Gamarnik, Jaganath, and Sen, like it's, it's been on archive for a month. So there is quite an activity around this type of, of phase transition these days. 
uh, where they studied the, the maximum likelihood estimator, so the zero temperature version of the problem, if you want. And they found, so in their study, they, they do the, the usual, if you want, it's connected to the usual statistical physics approach in the sense that they first, len, uh, they first let n go to infinity, the number of variables, and a posteriori, they study what happens when you let the sparsity go to zero. But what they predict is that you should observe something around this scaling, which is the same as what we have with the Bayesian optimal estimator. Okay? So in a sense, in this type of scaling, maximum likelihood uh, is good enough. Okay? Yes, yes. 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 I, I, I. So their previous results is again for this compressive sensing problem and they use, I mean, they use a number of properties that are specific to this problem. I don't know if the result extend there. It's not clear. So, so I, I mean, we did like a little computation on the corner of a table with, a, with Nicola, and it, it is not clear at all. I mean, I, I wouldn't bet on any of the two answers. I, I don't know. But from what we, we see real problems appearing when you try to, to have rho really smaller. I'm not sure that the picture uh, is valid. Uh, I, I don't know, honestly. I don't want to, to bias. Uh, that's an open question. Yes? So you mean... Ah. So this type of experiment? So which experiment? This one? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I really don't know, to be honest. Um, so I, I would tend to think, because uh, in a number of problems, this is the case, the concentration techniques that you use, if I've been careful enough, they're, they're close to optimal. I would be surprised that you can get, that you can gain a two-third uh, by improving on the, on the techniques that I have here. So I'm, I'm not sure that uh, the picture really applies in the very, very, very small sparsity regime. Um, honestly, it's, I don't know. Yeah, or, yeah uh, in this problem, uh, the fact that the noise is Gaussian it does not matter. Yes, so there are universality results that essentially say that if you can study, at least in, the, in this planted p spin problem, if you can study the Gaussian case, this extends to generalized version of it. So I, I didn't do the analysis on this. Maybe there is a subtlety in the Chanel universality theorem, but I would say that the picture extends to this case. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So, I mean, all that needs to be done. I, d I, I don't know at the moment, but <laughs> that's an that's, that's in interesting direction. Yeah. So, just to mention that uh, there, is, there has been a lot of activity in the statistical physics community that are actually trying to precisely compute finite size corrections to, to, the, to the asymptotic free energy. 
Uh, so the original motivation of this work was not finite size corrections. It was really to study what happens in the, these corners of phase diagram. Along the way, we got this quite precise results on this, on this uh, finite end fluctuations. And uh, so I w the technique is actually quite simple that, that we use. So here there are very powerful techniques, but quite elaborated. Uh, maybe we, we can put our technique here, and it has at least the advantage of being very simple with respect to some of the methods that are there. So OK. This is really an open question. I don't have the answer, but how generic is this uh, type of all or nothing phase, phase transition? I don't know. Now, we rigorously know that it happens at least uh, in the, this random linear estimation problem. It's this compressive sensing. It happens in sparse PCA. I have hints, uh, numerical hints, that it happens in uh, the planted perceptron when, when the, the, the weights are uh, becoming super sparse. Uh, is there a kind of generic uh, underlying mechanism that we do not understand yet? I would tend to say yes, but uh, this is uh, ongoing. I don't know. Uh, I have five minutes left, right? I'm on time or? Eight, I, 30, I finish at 30, okay. So I can give you a, an idea of uh, the proof technique. Uh, which is based on this so-called uh, adaptive interpolation method that I've been uh, developing with uh, Nicola during my postdoc, which is a kind of uh, evolution of the usual, the standard uh, guerra toninelli interpolation method for spin glasses for people in the audience that, uh, that are physicists, that allowed to, to get bounds for the Shankton Kirkpatrick models and this type of models. Uh, and this, this this uh, evolution of the interpolation method is, is specifically designed for these inference problems, at the moment, at least. So the idea is the following. You define uh, the so-called interpolating model, which is a, a, a generalized version of your uh, original model, where you now have access to two types of observations, OK? So you have observations uh, that are similar to the observations in the original model, so here they are uh, two-body interactions between your, uh, your x's. Uh, instead, you see now the, the signal choice ratio has been rescaled by a t-dependent quantity, by just 1 minus t, where t is, is time and belongs to 0, 1, OK? And now we have access to another type of observations, which are totally decoupled, OK? The x's are decoupled here. Each observation only carries information about one component. Uh, and you have Gaussian noise like this, and the signal choice ratio uh, is a function which is open at the moment. I only require that at t equal to zero, uh, this function is essentially zero, and it is positive. Okay. So you see that this this channel here will actually construct the non-trivial part that appears in the replica formula, which is there, which is this little mutual information. You see that you have a Gaussian uh, scalar estimation problem here. Uh, between a, So this, these are your observations. And this mutual information is what I want to construct thanks to this uh, second channel here. And hopefully, if we do the computations properly, the, the remaining part of this potential will appear in the computation. Okay. So let me mention that this type of uh, Gaussian uh, scalar estimation problem they always appear in these uh, densely connected inference problems. Okay, this is a kind of universal term, so you don't have to think much. If you have a dense problem and you want to do an interpolation, just interpolate onto a Gaussian problem like this. Okay? All right, so for this extended model, this time dependent model, uh, you can define its mutual information. Uh, between the, the signal you want to infer and these two types of observations, okay? And now uh, you, do the, you use the, the, the standard machinery of uh, interpolation, which is that you want to compare the two boundaries by writing the fundamental theorem of calculus. So this is trivial. Uh, and uh, you notice that this part, so this object at time equal to zero, what it is, it is the object 
that you want to compute. It's the complicated high dimensional uh, integral that a priori you have no way to compute. This is the mutual information that you're aiming for. And indeed at time equal to zero, because I require this object to be small, this does not carry information about x, so it does not participate in the mutual information. And at time equal to zero, this is nothing else than the model I want to study, okay? Now, at time equal to one, this part, okay, this disappears, so this contains no information about x, so it does not participate there, and only this channel matters. And this channel constructs exactly the non-trivial part that appears in the replica symmetric formula in this potential. And when you compute these derivatives, you have things that pop out, okay, and you, if you combine things properly, you get this sum rule which connects this complicated object to a simpler object, to the formula that you want to prove essentially, evaluated at a special value, which is this, uh, this interpolating function, plus stuff, and this, uh, this mess that you combine uh, all together is called the remainder. And the point is that this remainder, it can be very complicated, but it only depends on uh, the, this interpolating function here, and on an average quantity, uh, an intensive quantity, which is the order parameter in the problem, which is the so-called overlap in physics, okay? It's the Edwards-Anderson overlap. Uh, so it, it's, it, it's connect, it, it quantifies the, the, the quality of estimation. So this is the inner product between the ground truth signal and little x, where little x is a sample from the Gibbs distribution associated to this problem. So the posterior distribution associated to this problem. This bracket notation means the expectation with respect to the posterior, which depends on time, because this model depends on time. And this big E notation means the expectation with respect to all the quenched variables, which means in this case the data, or equivalently the, the X here, the ground truth, and the noise. Okay? So you can see, you put these two type of, of, of observation as a single vector, if you want. It's, it's just, it's one object, if you want, and you, it, it carries some amount of information about x, okay? Is it clear? Yeah, and here they are already, already weighted like this. Yes, properly weighted, yeah. And now, the, let's say, the novelty of this method, which is not anymore uh, so new, uh, with respect to the usual interpolation techniques, is that you can play with this degree of freedom, which is the choice of this interpolating function, in order to get two matching bounds. Usually you get one bound with these techniques. So if you take a linear, simple interpolation where uh, this function depends linearly on time, but with not any slope, the slope is given by the argmin of this replica symmetric formula, then you get directly one uh, bound, which is the, the one you would usually get with classical interpolation techniques. And the point here, you have, I have a wiggle, which means that this is up to small corrections, and all the, the, um, the messy part of this work is to control this finite size correction as accurately as possible, okay? And then if you choose this interpolating function a bit more smartly, as being the solution of this equation, then you get the other bound. But what is this equation? It's a first order differential equation that tells you that the slope, so the derivative, the time derivative of this function should be equal to the expected overlap. The expected overlap is a function of time, and actually it's also a function of the interpolating function itself. And so you have to be careful, but you notice that this is, it has a structure of a differential equation, so you know it has a solution. You can choose R being uh, verifying this equation, and if you plug that in there, essentially you get the other bound, and again you need to control the finite size corrections very precisely to get uh, the theorem I showed you. So let me just uh, wrap up. Uh, so replicas are still valid, valid at least in some regimes in the corners of this phase diagram, so this is good news. I don't bet that it's always true. I mean, the, the message has to be take, taken with care. These interpolation techniques are very natural in order to catch these finite size corrections, which I think is, is quite nice. 
Uh, this all or nothing transition seems a quite generic phenomenon. How generic, I don't know. This is an interesting question. What about more complex models, so multi-layers, out of the Nishimori line, which means away from the Bayesian optimal setting, and so on and so forth. And uh, does it happen, this phenomenon, for algorithms? So actually, Scott told us, uh, told us a bit about that. It at least, I mean, Yeah, so, yes, so there are at least some algorithms where it happens. It happens also for AMP, uh, at least in the, this compressive sensing setting. Does it happen all the time? I don't know. I would guess that if it happens for the information, for the base optimal estimator, it should happen for AMP. Uh, does it happen for gradient-based algorithm and so on? I don't know. So this is uh, things to be done, and I will stop there. Thank you. <laughs>